Captain Justin. He's the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Steel Institute and uh, has kindly donated some of his time this morning to give us a presentation on the industry. So, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Darren. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I gather I'm talking to people that are in the, in the steel game in one shape or other. And uh, I guess I, what I was looking to do today was just run through some issues that the, uh, that the steel industry is, is facing. Be no surprises as to that, but you know what we can do to garner support to put pressure to, on, on you know, particularly in, uh, in federal politics, to what we can do to you know try and increase demand. Uh, and we've got an industry that's invested very heavily in its productive capacity, and I guess you know this is, this is obviously at the, at, the, at the high end, state of the art. And clearly, automation is the ticket to the game these days. I mean, without that, you know, you, you, we, and we've got an industry that has invested heavily in its competitive capacity, uh, but it is it is suffering through a lack of demand, a lack of work. So, some of what I'll be talking about is, is that I'll give you a bit of a broader overview of ASI, but just. Uh, um, basically, we're a, uh, an industry uh, body. Uh, we, we provide technical marketing and industry representation uh, services to our members. We're the peak industry body for steel uh, in the country. Our members cover right through the channel. Um, not so much, I, I think there's, uh, there's uh, sheet metal as part of you know, the sheet metal customers. Not so much at the sheet metal, but certainly on the black steel side of things. Uh, and, and also into uh, uh, steel sheds, uh, you know, the, the coated product side of things. But our whole channel is obviously affected by lack of demand, and the lack of demand, we believe, is primarily due to the huge amount of imported finished product, uh, and that's due to an absence of government policy. So once that happens, the whole channel does miss out. We've got issues to do with compliance uh, or non-compliance of, of incoming stuff. Um, the sort of things that we get involved with as, 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 a, as an organisation, as an industry body, there's a three key themes. One is growing steel intensity, and that's basically you know, steel versus concrete, steel versus timber. Um, Maximise local content, that's this whole business about you know, getting, trying to increase demand, get policy, get compliance, uh, promoting industry's capability, capacity, promoting you know, the organisations that invest in, in gear like this. And safety and reliability, clearly that's, um, that's something that our Australian industry has got a very proud track record of, is its safety, its reliability, uh, its quality, um, its compliance with, with, with codes and standards. So a lot of the work we do is, is, is seminars, uh, it's uh, briefing sessions, technical publications, uh, advocacy to government, marketing, promoting, promoting steel, promoting the uptake of technology, and, and not just the buying of the technology, but getting it harnessed properly right up and down the channel so that, you know, from, from the design through to the, the, the detailing, through to the fabrication, through to the construction, etc., that there is, you know, good linkages there so that we are getting maximum benefit out of the investment, the big investment that our industry has made. Um, so I'll talk a bit about industry capability capacity. I'll talk about the current dire situation and, and, and I guess you know cutting to the, uh, the, the not the solution but you know what we're what we're on about here post policies. I'm off to Canberra tomorrow for a range of meetings with uh, with MPs and Minister Combay and clearly we've we've got a you know, a crisis situation facing manufacturing in general, steel in particular, and you know Canberra needs to needs to get on board with this and. In a way, we're not talking you know, subsidies, handouts, things that would contravene WTO. We're talking about policies that will stimulate demand in this country, demand that, that is there but is flowing out of the country. We've got, and, and forgive me if I'm talking mostly on the, on the black steel side of things, but within that channel, we've got uh, steel fabricators that have invested some 300 million in the last three or four years, sorry, sorry 500 million in the last three or four years. We've got major new facilities uh, uh, around the country, uh, particularly in the West and South Australia. They're installing you know, a lot of the technology that uh, you're seeing here, uh, and that, as I said, is, is really the, the ticket to the game. Without that, uh, they're, 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 they're just not competitive. With that, we believe that you know, they've got an offer. Clearly, they've got a, they've got a, a quality competitive offer. Um, we've got a, a very proud track record in this country uh, of making uh, you know, steel to support our, our mining, our oil and gas, our infrastructure and our, our building sectors. Uh, no surprise that you know, a lot of those sectors, well, particularly building is down, but uh, the resources sector is, is booming. Uh, we've got a, a track record in modular construction, so when we hear pushback on the LNG projects, the coal seam gas projects in Queensland, 
the uh, Gorgon and, and uh, Woodside projects in the west, INPEX in, in Northern Territory. We have got a track record, not in the mega modules, but certainly in modules up to a thousand tonnes with a lot of complexity, uh, with a lot of quality standards. Uh, we've we've uh, served that part of the industry well. Obviously a lot of automation going into the, into the fabrication uh, and construction of those. Uh, we've got uh, track record in, in LNG, that's uh, Woodside LNG, um, that uh, obviously went through highly automated processes in the West. Uh, and um, you know, that was a job that uh, uh, was, well, that was the last of the Woodside jobs that was done here, which is, which is a tragedy given the track record that we've got. We've got a, a very strong value proposition in, in, in terms of, uh, of technology data control and, and traceability documentation. Uh, right through, we have the local manufacturers, the quality of materials, the training and skills in this country lead to high quality workmanship, avoidance of rectification. What we can say is that we've got a competitive offer or value proposition in terms of, of our quality, in terms of our delivery to schedule, our delivery to budget. Um, all those factors is, is a given that you know, uh, compliance to specifications. Where we do struggle is on an hour, an hour for an hour comparison uh, with, uh, with Asia, uh, particularly where there's free issue steel, free issue drawings. That's how a lot of these jobs are getting carved up now and that's where we're missing out. Number of uh, uh, large, large-ish fabricators are, are around the country, most working under 50% capacity. Uh, the three big guys in, in Perth got a, a capacity of 140,000 tonnes on their own. This figure here of 1.8 million, I guess we've got to pull all stops out to get to that. That would be with uh, yeah, uh, sort of two and three shift operations seven days a week, but certainly comfortably in excess of 1.1 million tonnes. A lot of capacity. We're doing probably at the moment in the order of five to six hundred thousand tonnes, more like about a third of our capacity. Um, now that that is you know that's the hub of the problem here, now, and that's just in the black steel side of things. You amplify that around the country in sheet metal, in manufacturing in general. Uh, this is where there's need for you know, urgent government action. The main game in town, no surprise, is, is obviously the resource projects, automotive and general. Um, you know, general uh, building construction and, and general, fa uh, general manufacturing uh, is down. The, the size of the pie is certainly increasing with the, uh, has increased with the resources boom. So our traditional markets are down. Our, our commercial, industrial, residential building markets as you know, a flow on impact of the GFC are well and truly down. Manufacturing with the high dollar is down. Uh, manufacturing as a, as, a, as a percentage of the Australian economy and in terms of total employment is down. All strong pointers for the need for government intervention with, with supportive policies. Imported fabricated steel now, that is a significant underestimate. Uh, the ABS uh, don't uh, capture very, very uh, sort of uh, co uh, accurately what comes in in uh, sort of in, in assemblies and so forth because it can get called all manner of things like a, like a stack of reclaimer wouldn't show up as a piece of fabricated gear. Is that something we can uh, we obviously lobby to, to happen in that To get better data. Yeah. We've been able to extract more recently to this, this was done a couple of months back uh, j just in the last few weeks, figures that are showing that we're, we're, we're certainly in excess of 600,000 tonnes of imported fabricated steel. Now you add to that, you know, the coated steel and, and so forth, and you know, it's it's and that and that's that's in finished form. There's always been quite a lot of raw steel come in, and that's uh, we've got two manufacturers here, Blue Scope and One Steel, who who sell at or around you know, world parity pricing. So what we're talking about here is on the finished product side of things, uh, upwards of 600,000 tonnes and growing and growing at the rate of 20% per annum. So I mean, this is. This is serious stuff. Don, I think you said before we're, we're currently looking at a third of our capacity, which was about 500,000. Yep. And we're currently importing 600,000. Correct. So we're importing more than we're actually that, that, than that we're actually manufacturing. Yeah. Now, you know, we've been in and out of Canberra, um, goodness, every every month at least for the last 12 months, from the prime minister to the industry minister, right, right down. There's there's an understanding, there's an awareness, there's a there's a uh, how would you say? Yeah, there's no there's no silver bullet here, but we believe with with government leadership, with a whole of government approach, 
and with some supportive policy, we could see a significant turnaround. And we're not, we're not saying we can do it all. We don't, you know, we don't want it all because we, we haven't got the capacity to do it all. But a doubling of what we're currently, you know, what we've currently got would, would mean that, you know, what do we want out of this? We want every shop around Australia to be full as a result of the resources boom. And other countries get that happening, you know. Norway, Canada, these sort of countries that are resource rich, they don't allow this sort of thing to happen. You know, they don't they go border into straight duties, so like protectionism against locals. We're looking at a broad spectrum, a, a number of different um, proposals toward government. Correct, and I'll run through to those, but yes, you're right. It's, uh, this is not Fortress Australia we're dealing with here. It, it can't be. Um, you know, that would contravene WTO and you know, our industry is not about protection. But with, with leadership, with supportive policies and with motivating the proponents to engage locally and the way of doing that we believe is through accelerated tax depreciation to the proponents that if on their, their next you know, iron ore investment they, they, they engage locally, they get uh, accelerated tax depreciation for that component that's engaged locally. So th it's a cost neutral decision from their point of view. Is it true to say that some of the larger projects in the west are not getting quoted at all? They're not even Correct. an opportunity for tender? Yep. Which is a real shame. Which is a real, yeah. About that, at least. And, and, um, and that's, just, uh, you know, that's just a kick in the guts for, for an industry that's invested heavily in anticipation of this boom, but uh, they're either not getting the opportunity to quote or it's been specified to foreign specs or in the case of Gorgon to JIS standards which aren't supplied here. Uh, so our industry is being specified out of, of, uh, of projects. Yeah, uh, and that's a, that's a very real and a very serious issue. In terms of the capex, uh, upwards of 450 billion of, of announced projects, um, mostly in the West, but Queensland certainly got a got a good uh, a good share of uh, with coal seam gas, uh, um, coal and um, yeah port facilities etc. <coughs> These projects, uh, as you'd understand, are all very steel intensive, so we are we are missing a golden opportunity here, and one that would provide a immediate and meaningful stimulus, not just you know, to the government, but for the you know, for the whole you know, in, in, in the national interest. Uh, resources, the biggest game in town, with with LNG leading the pack. Um, but all sectors have been going up. Let's hope that continues, of course. Um, and as I said uh, earlier, we, we're not saying we can do it all, but we, we need our fair share. Um, yeah, we, you know, we mentioned uh, you know, projects we're just not getting a, a crack at it. The Sino Iron Project imported every stick of steel on that project, 100,000 tonnes. Now, they, you know, in, their, in their application uh, for EPBS uh, policy, uh, tariff concession, said that uh, they had 85% local content. Now the only way they can get to that is, 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 is lumping everything in construction and operations. And of course all the civil works and the dredging and the, you know, the air flights and the catering and cleaning etc. But we didn't get a stick of steel, even the footpaths, free precast concrete footpaths uh, uh, were imported. You know, the West Australian government doing a, a deal with the Chinese on, on Okiji, although that's a project that's under a bit of a cloud at the moment. Gina Reinhardt on the Roy Hill project, uh, iron ore project up in the northwest, importing the whole content for that, 90,000 tonnes. Clive Palmer, who you probably saw on the tel telly last night, uh, and he's, he's a character, yeah. Uh, this China First project, the, the signs are, are, are not good on that. I mean, even the name of the project sort of uh, doesn't inspire confidence that we're going to get much of a crack at it. So it is, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a dire situation. Um, you know, you all understand, you know, the, 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 uh, with Bluescope and One Steel, they're, they're uh, well publicised losses and job cuts. Now, that's obviously running right through the channel. S you know, distribution, fabrication, clearly, you know, to everybody that supplies goods and services into the industry. So we're, we're losing, you know, um, potential to lose many more uh, thousands of jobs and apprenticeships. So I'm, I am painting a grim picture here because it, this is serious stuff. We've got an industry here that that in you know, manufacturing in general, but steel in particular, uh, we, we, we need to get government attention here. We've got a meeting in Canberra with the steel chiefs uh, from One Steel and Blue Scope with Minister Combe on Thursday. Uh, he's new into the role. Uh, he has shown some empathy to steel with, you know, around the, the steel transformation plan, but you know, we, we want not handouts, we want work. And, and uh, he, he, uh, he needs to be the, the other champion of that. 
Okay, so our policy prescription, we're saying to government, <coughs> they've got all these in place schemes, and you will have heard of, I think, a number of those, ICN um, and, and uh, you know, the anti-dumping legislation, Australian industry participation plans. Uh, th these are, uh, well, government funded initiatives. We're not saying that, uh, that, uh, that these things should stop, uh, but they're, they're, they're necessary conditions, but they are not sufficient. On top of this, there needs to, these are mostly focused on, on the supply side of the equation, trying to improve competitiveness and, and so forth, which is, which is you know, clearly necessary. But we need policy that focuses on the demand side of the equation. Um, and that impacts on some of the things there. Foreign Investment Review Board approval. We just think it's an absolute travesty of justice there, where um, investors, foreign investors can come into this country with their finance and have that finance decision linked to the investment decision, uh, sorry, to the supply decision. So basically we're shut out of it, uh, you know, a, because you know, sometimes these are you know, foreign owned, uh, sorry, well, uh, government, uh, com communist government owned enterprises buying in the country here. There's steel companies that are linked back right through from steel manufacturer through into the, into the fabrication. We've, uh, uh, we're aware of W2 World Trade Organisation provisions. We're not looking at any form of you know, mandating or tariffs or you know, uh, things, subsidies and things that could be in contravention. But you know, let's uh, get government to you know, push the envelope to, to, to sort of uh, map out what can be done, not come up with excuses all the time about what can't be done to support our industry here. Often we believe that World Trade Organisation and free trade is used as a smokescreen excuse, and we're the only ones playing by those rules. Um, centrepiece of what we've been pushing for, and there were some announcements in the media two weeks ago by Combe, uh, is Australian industry participation plans. We've been pushing long and hard for this. Something that's transparent, something that's got teeth to it, something that uh, has got rigour. So you break down this thing like Sino Iron, saying they've got 85% local content, and you break down into the contestable items you know, the stuff that can be made here or overseas and report against the percentages uh, occurring there. Um, these, these Australian industry participation plans, they need to have penalties attached to them, they need to have uh, uh, rigour, needs to be audited by a, an expert uh, independent board. Um, so that very much is the corner piece of what we're about. We believe they should be compulsory for all projects in Australia greater than $100 million. Um, now, for that to occur, it'll need uh, COAG, uh, you know, the, the, it'll need the states uh, on board with the feds. Um, at the moment, the feds have only got the interest in uh, industry participation plans where it's tied to this uh, enhanced project bylaw scheme, which is in, in effect a, a tariff, tariff concession. Uh, we're saying that all projects that, that uh, submit uh, an environmental impact statement must have a must have an Australian industry participation plan. Proponents are happy, they'll play by the rules, you know, whatever the rules are. Uh, if there's environmental approvals, uh, clearly they've, they've got to comply with that. Indigenous, uh, similarly, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll comply with that. We're saying that up there on the same platform as that, Australian industry participation needs, needs to have the same level of importance and, 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 uh, and rigour. Uh, and, and that's, that's a, a sort of a government-led uh, um, sort of, uh, well, government leadership uh, strategy. Um, in terms of our prescription, you know, we, it, it, you know obviously we come under Minister uh, for Industry Combe, uh, through, running through COAG. Um, we've got, uh, uh, hanging off the Australian Industry Participation Plan, to give it to incentivise the proponents because I mean they're not going to, they could still say in the plan, oh well, it's cheaper overseas, that's what we're going to do. But through um, conditions put under Foreign Investment Review Board approval, whereby they come cap in hand to government wanting to invest in Australia's non-renewable resources, government should say, well, you know, where's your plan, what, what's the industry development, what are the jobs, what are the, you know, what's the benefit, what's the, the broader benefit for the country besides the bit of royalty that gets paid. Similarly with skills development, you know, clearly if we have a disconnect with apprentices not being taken on then we're not going to be in a position to be, to be able to produce uh, down the track. Tax incentives, uh, most important, uh, basically this is the carrot, this is something that 
uh, would be cost neutral to the proponent. He would get a tax incentive in the form of accelerated tax depreciation or a discounted royalty. The government would be providing that incentive but it would come back to the government in terms of, of increased tax take because the work that flows out of the country, not a dollar of tax gets paid on that. So you'd have the tax from the from the company tax, from the PAYG. Yeah, you're not paying out on the on the on the uh, uh, you know the social security, and you've got a very large multiplier effect with manufacturing jobs, something like three to one, uh, you know, out there in the general community. So, you know, if a town loses a, a major manufacturer, it's not just that business that goes, as you know, it's all the you know it's the bakery and the school and the, all that. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's in government's interest to ensure these jobs stay in the regions. And clearly there's a, there's a role there for you know, technology transfer. That's any advanced country expects that as, as part of a condition on the investments. So we're saying this, this is compulsory, this plan, and then the, the, that's the, the centrepiece uh, of what we're about, and then the tax incentives um, uh, and, and uh, uh, conditions on FIRB feeding into that. So, we don't believe that's a, you know, that's not a, uh, how would you say, a burdensome thing to impose on the proponents, but uh, it's something that uh, is, is, is definitely needed to capture the demand that's, you know, that, that, that could be here, but is currently flowing out of the country. Um, you know, there's a mix of interest around the table. We, we, we've got uh, obviously a, a range of uh, programs happening around, around uh, trying to stimulate demand for steel by promoting steel's environmental credentials against concrete or promoting local steel's environmental credentials against uh, um, you know, uh, stuff that's fabricated offshore. We've got an environmental sustainability charter where we've got a number of fabricator members that uh, have a, have a uh, auditing process that uh, gets them uh, this environmental sustainability charter which entitles to a, them to a, a point under the Green Building Council, uh, Green Star, uh, tool. We've also imported heavily into a, a life cycle inventory project in, in, in a forum of, or in a, a cluster of all building products, which is you know, concrete and timber and, and windows and, and glass, etc. Uh, and steel stewardship forum, which is taking uh, the, you know, the cradle to, to grave approach. I won't, I won't dwell on this, it might be sort of uh, you know, worthwhile just to open up to a bit of discussion. So quite a bit happening there. Technology and clearly that's uh, you know, a very, very important platform. Our, our industry has not been backward in, in the uptake of technology. It needs to, to keep investing in it, continu continuous improvement. And you know, getting better technology integration is something that we, we are strongly advocating. You know, the, the, the job's not done when the investment's made. It's got, it's got a link right back to the design. It's got a link right through into the construction. Um, the, obviously, the tools are there, and they're, and they're being used heavily in some sectors, and they're being under, underutilised in others. But you know, it, it obviously all starts uh, with the 3D model, uh, which can happen back you know, at the architect or the engineer, depending on, on the type of project. Uh, that links in with the engineer's structural uh, design and, and, and so forth. Um, running through to the fabrication drawings, the, uh, you know, which produce the NC files, which drive the, the machines out here, the, you know, the robotics and the cutting and the, and the drilling machines. Uh, the engineering documentation, right through to you know, parts and erection, um, assembly. And embedded in the 3D model, the smarts now with BIM are such that it's got the through life support right through you know, all the attributes of, of all the parts that go into, into any structure, any, any, uh, any building any assembly. So summarising where we're at in terms of you know, demand, we, we definitely need um, to get a fairer share of, of major projects. It's just, you know, here's the country that, uh, you know, the two-speed economy, you know, we've got uh, uh, probably, uh, I think the quote the other day in the paper, probably 95% of the country is, is, is growing at less than the, than the 3 or 3.2% 3 uh, GDP growth. So if you're not in that lane, you, 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 you're either treading water, you could be going backwards. Traditional markets are, for steel are down and projected to stay down. Uh, imported fabricated steel increasing at an alarming rate, uh, at least 20% per year. There's a, there's a massive pipeline of upcoming major resource projects and infrastructure projects. Um, 
that our share on these major projects, and we've got uh, we've got a sort of a basket of uh, I think it's about 14 or, or 16 major projects where we've only got 10 to 12 percent market share, and these are the these are the big ones. You know, this is the you know the Gorgon and the Pluto and, and these sort of things. Um, we've got uh, a lot of capacity. We have invested. Uh, so when we get pushback from government that it's a smokestack industry, not true. You know, I mean, your customers have got you know, a lot of this gear. There's, you know, we've, a lot of what we've been doing is getting the MPs out into the workplaces to see the sort of you know, investment that's on the ground, not just in the equipment, but the skills, the, the know-how, the apprenticeships, etc. We've got thousands of jobs being lost, the situation's dire, we need the government support. And we obviously need you know, the businesses to keep the pressure. So what do we want out of this sort of briefing is, you know, you, you, you've all got uh, you know, contacts with, through you know, your own communities, through to, you know, your local politicians, state and federal. Um, so we need to sort of uh, get you know, uh, a push for urgent government action to stimulate demand. Um, we believe that what What's proposed is an effective and immediate stimulus plan, because the workers these are real jobs uh, and real work that's uh, that's being uh, happening offshore. So that was sort of you know that in terms of the presentation. But happy to you know get involved in any any discussion, get your your thoughts about how we can add more pressure, um, because you know this is a yeah we believe a, a crisis for the for the industry. It's quite low in Australia, um, disturbingly low. Um, it's, it, it is in the order of 10%, whereas in the UK it's 70, in, in US it's 50, even New Zealand's sort of uh, hovering around the, the 50%. It was on a growth trend. We've, we had a, a big push for it uh, uh, around uh, 2006, 2007, took it from 5% up to 15, 17%. Uh, then there was the rampant steel price increases, you know, with the, uh, the, the shortages and so forth of steel and, you know, world steel prices increasing. And then the GFC and then no market. However, and, and this, is, this is a glimmer of hope, uh, is that we've just completed a, a national round of seminars to some uh, 600 people. In fact, Adelaide has yet to happen, but we had a, over 600 people and, and that's around steel has never been more cost competitive. We've, we've hit the sweet spot again on the cost curve. Uh, I think the uh, cost of formwork and concrete has kept increasing, where steel has definitely come off, and the cost of fabricated steel is at a, is at a, a point where uh, there is a cost competitive value proposition for steel versus concrete. And we're seeing a bevy of, of buildings uh, around the country, mostly on the east coast, well, yeah, up and down the east coast, uh, and a big one over in the west uh, that's, uh, that's about to happen. What about uh Connections as opposed to welded connections. We've yeah. definitely seen a movement towards uh, double clip angles, uh, which is, I guess, harnessing the, the automation. So um, we are, uh, through that seminar series I just mentioned, um, we've got fabricators that are, that are promoting that because that is, is definitely um, that's a way of harnessing automation. Yeah, so to the designer that seems to come through from the engineers and design through there, they think, well, well, well. They're yeah. Definitely a lot of our reach and a lot of our membership, we've got about 1,700 members and more than half those are, are in the engineering space. Um, and and you know, so we sort of promote you know, efficient use of, of, of steel and try and you know, to ease of design and so forth. And certainly that is a, a key message that we're pushing out there is, is consider, in fact, go for uh, double clip angles because that uh, is, a, is a more cost competitive solution than the, uh, the welded website plate. And uh, oh, obviously, a lot of education around you know, don't over specify your welds. You know, the, it's, a la it's a lazy cop out for engineers to specify full, full penetration butt weld. Probably, probably good for the, the welding consumable side of the thing, but uh, it's a, uh, you know, clearly it, it, those things, if it makes steel less competitive, then we're going to see less steel structures. So we need, obviously, to have the competitive offer, we need the most efficient steel design that, that we can achieve. Yep. 
And, and often it's more than that. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons we are missing out with the, you know, the trends that have, have, have adversely affect our industry are pretty well understood. Obviously, the, the high dollar, globalisation, modularisation, um, you know, where the, 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 the global supply chains moving into low cost, uh, large capacity Asian yards. Now, what that's led to is modularisation, which these modules are not just it's not just the steel, it's the piping, the electrics, the instrumentation, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the fire protection, all the commissioning and all of that. So that we are amortised over that, you, you, you know, your, 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 labor, your low labour cost makes it a, 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 you know, sort of a, a very attractive proposition for the proponents to offshore. It's, it's a very effective offshoring strategy. So we've been working with Peter Beattie, chairs a group, uh, uh, it's uh, called Buy Australia at Home and Abroad. This is the resource, that's a government initiative resource supply uh, envoy. Uh, and we're looking at ways of, if, all right, if we can't uh, retain the mega modules in this country because of, you know, th th there is an argument that Australia should be supplying fabricated sticks of steelwork into module yards. So we're, we're, we're sort of, you know, advancing that or having uh, an argument for carve-outs from those mega modules for early works that can be done in this country or, you know, higher quality stuff or, you know, there, 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 is, there is a sweet spot and we're finding that our, our larger fabricators in the West are, have picked up um, a fair bit since early last year. We had, uh, we had a crisis meeting with uh, the Premier there, Barnett. There was a march on Parliament House. He met with our industry. Yeah. You were there? There was five and a half thousand. Uh, we had the, obviously the unions were the, um, it was industry and unions combined. Uh, and um, Barnett, to his credit, he, he listened, uh, he, he acted. Basically, he, he met with uh, the ASI, met with four of the big fabricators. He was aghast at walking through the fab shops and seeing, seeing them at 15% you know, you know, capacity or, or less. Uh, the investments, the massive investments that they've made, uh, and that they just, they just weren't getting a piece of the action. He, he, he got the four, not more, uh, yeah, the, the four large proponents, Rio, BHP, um, Chevron, Woodside, uh, he got them in his office that week uh, and then on the Saturday he had them down in Quinana with the proponents and going through the shops. Now within the space of a few months the work, you know, they were crumbs that came through but they were decent sized crumbs so th they'd gone from 15 to 20 percent capacity to up at 50 to 60 percent in the top Four, four shops now. That hasn't spread right through the industry, but it's, it's meant that, you know, what that's demonstrated is that through government leadership and preparedness to thump the table, bang heads together, it can make a difference. Because these proponents, they want to be seen as good corporate citizens. They need, they need friends in government. You know, they need the, the approvals and uh, to be able to fast track and, and so forth. Why do you think our federal government takes such a lot of um, well, it's, so, it's such a low priority in this kind of, of politics. Uh, this is probably my personal view, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've had a bite my tongue on some of it. Um, clearly, the auto industry is, is treated as a special case. They've been very successful in, 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 in demonstrating the need for high tech, and, and I'm assuming you know, some of your uh, equipment probably would go into that, and, 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 and we think that's a good thing. Clearly, that you know, it's advanced countries have need advanced uh, manufacturing, and auto spurns a lot of that into you know, through, through parts, etc. Um, we believe also that steel is of equal importance, and not just at the steel making end. Clearly, that's that's of vital importance, but right through the channel at the steel process with the steel distribution and steel processing end. Because the channel is, you know, it, there are so many inter, interdependencies. You know, we're, we've got a, 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 la, a long chain on our, on, our, on our steel supply channel. And they're all linked, they're all important, and if one's broken, then we've got a problem. Now, where government will, uh, it's bad to, to, to pressure from, from auto. Uh, it gave some offsets to the steel producers you know, to offset against the, the burden of the carbon tax. This is the 300 million steel transformation plan. It's not a, you know, all it's doing is, is, is taking money on, on the one hand and giving it back on the other. It's not, it's not having a net benefit of improving the demand 
position for steel and we believe that's fair and square on the government. Now, we had Gillard, uh, the Prime Minister at our uh, convention last year, uh, she listened, she announced that they were going to do things around Australian industry participation. Uh, there was a, a committee, they, they came back with recommendations, the recommendations were adopted but we, we believe that that was watered down and, and, and sanitised and what was served up was a long way short of what's needed. I mean, this is a crisis. Having in, having government departments come up with, you know, sort of um, a long list of things, that, a, a bit of a tweak, is not, not going to cut. Mm. Um, they seem to come up with things like Enterprise Connect, which adds a lot of bureaucracy but doesn't get down to the core basic needs. Look, Enterprise Connect is something that we've been um, pretty uh, uh, supportive of, and indeed they've been supportive of the steel industry. Uh, I guess the, what I can, sort of, I can uh, positive statements I'm happy to make in terms of Enterprise Connect is that they do have programs aimed at getting at grassroots at, you know, at SME level, mm -hmm. and we've had a, a few rounds of uh, uh, seminars, uh, breakfast seminars to our, our, our membership, not just our membership, it's across, it's open to all. Uh, and, and, and that's around, uh, you know, well the last round was on pre-qualification and how to pre-qualify for, for tenders, uh, you know, what, what the clients are looking for. Uh, it, we had uh, uh, technology uptake um, uh, earlier last year. We had, um, uh, you know, business fundamentals and how to, you know, how, how to uh, you know, understand some of the business drivers and so forth. So, uh, and safety and, and so forth. So Enterprise Connect, I think, has been one of the, um, uh, one that we've welcomed in terms of its, its of its grassroots approach, but there's, there's no magic wand with any of that. Um, we reckon you know, let, if there's demand there, our industry will certainly you know, align around demand. Uh, it's done done. It's got a history of doing that over many many decades, and and we think that's government's prime responsibility is to proactively influence demand. And, now there are a lot of other uh, uh, manufacturing industry pushes, and uh, and, and yeah, we, we think they all make sense. You know, in terms of lowering the cost of regulation and lowering interest rates, um, you know, uh, anti-dumping regulation, uh, you know, trying to you know break down, you know, get that get that more uh, effective. There, there's a number of things that yeah, need to be done, but the the what we believe hap should happen is the uh, focus on the on the immediate, which is the the lack of demand, and and you know. Address that. So I've got uh, a two prompt question for you. Yep. What can I do as a local manufacturer to, to benefit myself and the industry? What, what's the, the ground roots of grassroots action that I need to take? I think you, you should uh, be promoting your, your wares as heavily as possible um, and, and um, not just the equipment but the whole investment in IP, skills, training, um, and so forth. So I think that's, that's fundamental that uh, yeah, industry. Is, it's not all back foot stuff. It's industry's got to get on the front foot and, and form relationships, get in early, promote its uh, network. Uh, so you're not, you know, you're not an island. You're going in with a cluster of uh, of others that are in that space. So there's a lot of self help that industry needs to do. Obviously, they need to keep investing. Now it's easy to say that and difficult to do it. And, you know, but uh, uh, that's that's just the, that's the ticket to the game. But you know, investments there, and I think get uh, an understanding uh, amongst your workforce that, hey, we're playing for keeps here, that, uh, you know, get uh, your, 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 your local politicians through the place, get them seeing the, the, the sort of skills, the, the investment, the equipment, and, and getting them angry about it. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the, you know, their jobs that are in the industry and, and, and uh, they, they, they need government leadership to be maintained. And uh, as far as the ASI is concerned, does the NSI get their funding? Well, this obviously costs a lot of money to lobby Sure. Uh, we're a member funded organisation. We've got sustaining uh, funding coming out of the manufacturing, uh, the three, uh, well, the Blue Scope, One Steel, and Fletcher building, Fletcher Steel. Uh, and then we've got you know, distributors, fabricators uh, running right there, you know, role formers, uh, suppliers of, of consumables, suppliers of goods and services. Um, it's it's always a struggle, you know, and, and we're always looking out for new members, uh, and and we're always you know, trying to you know, engage with our existing members, um, and clearly we're we're a reflection of of their situation. Yeah. I also uh, deal across the ditch in New Zealand. I found yep. that um, the ASA equivalent over there is a very strong body with uh, a lot of uh, participation, a lot of funding, a lot of backing from 
every GF, as you've just mentioned. So that's HERA or SCNZ or, or both? HERA. HERA, HERA mainly. Yeah, yeah. So I can see that, and they tend to get a lot more friction over there, obviously it's a smaller country, so a small voice mm. gets heard a little bit easier. Would you suggest the same here? I find a lot of also networking between fabricators to try and um, group together a larger project. It's not so much if I just worry about myself rather than everybody else. Darren, I think they do a lot of things right there, and, and we've got very close uh, ties with them. In fact, we've got a, uh, their technical uh, director over here at the moment. He's giving seminars, uh, giving one in Brisbane today on, on, uh, on um, design in, of buildings. Uh, we've got the, the HERA guy, sorry, the SNZ guy coming over next uh, Wednesday, uh, next Monday. Uh, that's about a joint thing uh, promoting um, uh, architectural steelwork uh, uh, later in the year, so a joint series we're, we're running. Um, their funding model, their business model is, uh, uh, and full credit to them, it, it's done on a levy situation uh, so that they are able, it, and it's, it's government uh, uh, legislated, so that their funding is generally more secure. Uh, however, when the market is down, that, that obviously does fluctuate with the market. Um, they're a broader, they're a research organisation, uh, research and development, we're, we're a technical marketing and industry development body. Um, and yeah, we've got very close ties and a lot of uh, a lot of respect for them. Uh, and yeah, we and we obviously don't try and reinvent the wheel. We share our work programs on a regular basis. Yeah. Great. Anybody else have any quick questions? The effect of the carbon tax coming in July, how's that going? Oh, adversely. Yeah, it's uh, it's all going the wrong way because it's uh, it's it's yet another burden on on local and and a free, a free kick to uh, to import it because they, they're not going to get hit with the carbon tax, so their, their power prices are not going to go up as a result of it and all the rest of it, yeah. So the need to invest in technology seems to be paramount. Oh yeah, particularly, I know some of your, your laser is, uh, so your gear is, is, is power saving gear and uh, that that is, has got to be, I mean it just makes a, a compelling business argument, you know, with high cost you know, of energy that you've got to you know, do whatever you can to have the most energy efficient gear and you know, that obviously applies to processing gear, galvanising gear, welding gear, etc.